church. He was in charge of the East Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, uh, East Jerusalem uh, Baptist Church. Uh, we are both associated with Bethlehem Bible College. We uh, bring to this issue a perspective as Palestinian Christians, uh, but we have both been very active on issues of peace and justice uh, for many years. Uh, I myself, as a lawyer, I am uh, an attorney in New York and in Israel and in Palestine. My office is in Jerusalem. Uh, I have been involved with human rights for many years. I was, I have to admit, involved in the negotiations back in 1994 that led to the Oslo Agreement. Uh, I always have to apologize uh, for it because uh, it turned out to be very badly for our people. But it is nothing, nothing like the current uh, plan that has been proposed by President Trump. Uh, and in fact, Anybody who actually reads the new plan and with any knowledge of the first plan will see the difference. For all its problems, the Oslo Agreement appeared to be an agreement between two parties. It gave at least a pretense of uh, respect for both parties. The current plan doesn't even pretend. Uh, it, it, it actually uh, reads like a very right-wing political uh, presentation. It creates new uh, goals that were never mentioned in the first Oslo agreement. It totally does away with the issue of refugees which was left to a later stage during the Oslo Agreement. Not only does it do away with it, it, it does it in a very uh, humiliating fashion. It says, there were Jews that were refugees in the Arab world of equal number to the Jews, to the Arabs, Palestinians who lost their uh, land in 1948. And since Israel has absorbed these refugees, uh, it's, the, it's not the responsibility of Israel to accept or to compensate any of these refugees. The refugee problem is finished. And any compensation that's due to them should go towards implementing the Trump plan. Uh, so there is no refugee question. And that the rights of the Jews to compensation should be handled separately. It also brought up a new issue that was never raised uh, before during the negotiations, which has always been a dream of the Israeli right wing, is let's get rid of the Arabs who are in the triangle uh, villages. Triangle villages are about eight villages very close to the 67 border that uh, Israel actually took after the 48 war, but they took them after the end of the war, so they didn't have a chance to clear them out. They woke up overnight and they found themselves in Israel, because Israel wanted more land. And so these people are Palestinian Arabs who are Israeli citizens. It's always been the dream of the Israeli right wing to get rid of them, to deny them their uh, citizenship in Israel and make them the responsibility of the Palestinian Authority, whatever it is. This has always been a fantasy of the Israeli right wing. Now it became part of uh, Trump's plan. Oh, there will be settlers will remain and we can give you these Arabs who are Israeli citizens. You take care of them. A third issue which has never been part of the negotiations in Oslo uh, but which has increasingly been asked by the Israeli right wing, but also the Israeli government, is a demand for the recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. 
and this will be part of the requirements for the Palestinians uh, to participate in it. Uh, the, the, the benefits for Israel are immediate. Immediately, the United States will recognize is all the existing settlements and will allow for the annexation of both these settlements and any land in the West Bank that Israel chooses. The benefits, if any, to the Palestinians will come after four years and after Israel and the U.S. certifies that they have fulfilled all the requirements and the conditions, which include really uh, impossible conditions that don't exist in any of the Arab world. We have to show that we have an atmosphere for investments, we have to show respect for human rights all of a sudden. The only time when human rights are mentioned. We have to have a transparent government. We have to have Palestinian control over the Gaza uh, Strip, away from Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and anybody else. That Israel will certify is good enough to meet its needs. After four years, then we'll be able to have some of the benefits that they are talking about. Uh, I'm sorry I say all these things as a person who's a lawyer who has read the documents. Uh, I don't recommend for those of you who have high blood pressure to read it because it is really infuriating. It is not a, a peace agreement at all. But, uh, to the point where even Israelis who have been committed or who talk about the two-state solution uh, including Danny and Levy, who wrote a very interesting article as a negotiator, and he's pulling his hair out. This is not a, a peace agreement. This is so different from Oslo. It is, it is really a statement of not just surrender, but a humiliating surrender that we don't expect any Arab, uh, Palestinian Arab will sign it. I start with this in order to give you a chance now to hear from Reverend Alex Awad uh, some of his points. And I will assure you there will be time for questions and answers uh, to get your perspective. Because uh, the point that I really want to make, uh, believe it or not, is that peace is still possible. That people of goodwill who are committed to justice should not despair. There is still the possibility of working for a peaceful solution with justice. And we can talk about what form that will take. Uh, but uh, I think ultimately we can either go back to international law and international legality, or we can, as, as Trump suggests, forget about all the UN resolutions and look at the situation, take a new, fresh look at the situation. Unfortunately, a new, fresh look at the situation is going to push us directly into a one-state solution where we have to work for justice and equality, where the issue is not now to create something and call it a state even though it's not a state. Uh, call it Jerusalem, even though it lies outside the boundaries of Jerusalem. But the Trump plan actually says that. He says all of Jerusalem inside the wall will be under full Israeli sovereignty and control. There are two neighborhoods in Shafat, the refugee camp in Shafat, which is outside the wall, and Kufar Aqab. Any of you know that area? It's a densely populated place on the other side of al and maybe parts of Idaria. You can call it Al-Quds or Jerusalem or any other name you wish to call it, but Jerusalem itself, forget it. That is only for the Israelis. So the vision that is presented by the plan is, is really totally unacceptable and it's not intended to be accepted by anybody. It's just a statement of, this is the reality, 
get over it, you lost, deal with it, this is what you can get. If you're a good boy, maybe there will be some financial contribution at the end, if you behave well and if you accept this, but there are no assurances, there are no assurances. The Arab world has to come up with that money, not Israel and not the US. Uh, this is, uh, very briefly, a summary of Trump's plan, but we have, if we have to go back to uh, the drawing board, if we have to go back and study the situation, maybe it is time for us to go back to the drawing boards and give a new look at it, because it's true, Trump is right about one thing. We have failed to achieve peace so far. The United Nations have not uh, arrived at peace. Direct negotiations have not brought us any closer to peace. And maybe we have to make, take a new look at the situation. But where that new look will take us, they may not like where it will take us. Because it will take us closer to real justice, I believe, than any of the different ideas that were suggested. With this, I turn over to Reverend Alex Howard to give us some of his uh, thoughts on this subject. And Rahkit, I spoke without a microphone. Um, good evening. Good evening. alaikum. Wow. Uh, how many of you speak Arabic? How many of you don't speak Arabic? Okay, for your sake, we'll continue in English. Okay, we'll continue uh, in English for the sake of the very few. But from time to time, if we get excited, we may forget the English and we'll resume in Arabic, okay? All right, assalamu alaikum. <laughs> okay, uh, well, Jonathan um, gave you a little bit um, introduction about what uh, Trump and his company call the deal of the century and how it is failing. And of course, uh, I'm amazed, uh, amazed at all the organizations, individuals, governments, leaders who said the deal of the century is dead on arrival, dead on arrival. And so we are not expect expecting to succeed. However, to say it is dead, to say the peace, uh, the deal of the century is no good, does not help the Palestinians either. The Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, in the refugee camps around the Arab world, in the West Bank, are not really helped just by saying the peace deal, Trump's peace deal is not working. That does not put bread on their table. So we need, we need peace. We still need genuine peace. This is why my title, 10 things you can do to promote peace in Israel and in Palestine. And that is for us, for us. Uh, uh, us is everyone who loves peace in the Holy Land. Uh, I usually go to churches and also Jonathan Kutab, uh, Dr. Jonathan Kutab, we go to churches and we are trying to help Americans all over the United States. Uh, to try to understand the situation in the Middle East as it really is. So uh, even though this program uh, targets people in the church, but I think it targets peace activists anywhere, regardless of their race, religion, creed, or anything. So uh, th this will be uh, good for all of us. Okay, now I want to go to the next one. And I think, let me see which button I touch to go to the next one. I don't want to do the wrong thing. Um, oh, okay, good, good, okay. Here, uh, you know, we are called to be peacemakers. We are, you know, whether we are Muslims, Christians, or Jews, we are called to promote Peace. Right? Yes. Okay, you can talk with me, it's okay. Right? Right, right. all right, we'll continue. Okay, P 
peace in Israel and Palestine is possible. Like Dr. Jonathan said, we really believe in the possibility of peace. This state of lack of peace is not going to stay forever. And, and yeah, we will talk about more. Uh, we need peace to stop violence, bloodshed, and destruction that has been going on for too many years. Until today, in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, people are being killed, people are being maimed. And we want to stop that. That's why we don't want to give, for, uh, give up on making peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Threats to Al-Aqsa Mosque generate anger among Muslims all over the world. You know, uh, sometimes Israelis try to take over the Al-Aqsa Mosque. That aggravates Muslims, not only in Palestine, but all, all over the world. And it makes things uh, really uh, bad. Violence, death, and destruction on the streets of Jerusalem and Bethlehem brings suffering to both Israelis and Palestinians, and also Jews, Muslims, and Christians all over the world. Lack of peace in the Holy Land is hindering interreligious dialogue. Sometimes uh, groups of Jews, uh, Muslims, Christians, they want to have a dialogue, but when things are bad in Hebron, in Ramallah, in Jerusalem, in Palestine, anywhere, it really hinders the interfaith dialogue between members of the monotheistic religions. Okay. May I interrupt you here and say that for many years... Can you hear him all right, or should yeah. he come here? Yeah, we are good. Okay. For many years, we have given up uh, on the word peace. It has become a dirty word in Arabic. When you talk about peace, it's a dirty word. The other side, while they're full of violence, they use peace all the time. Good morning in Hebrew is shalom. Good evening is shalom. Hello is shalom. Goodbye is shalom. Uh, the word shalom is always on their tongue, but their actions do not show peace. So we need to repossess this word peace. We believe in peace. But peace has to have a component of justice. Otherwise, it's not real peace. And peace is not the absence of violence because every day we experience violence. The war is violence. The checkpoints are violence. The settlements constitute violence. The daily oppression that we have is violence. So when they tell you, oh, there's, there's, there's been relative quiet in Gaza. What do they mean relative quiet? It means the Israelis can do everything they want and the Palestinians are not resisting. This is not peace. Uh, this is really submission and it has no connection with peace. Real peace is something we want and we believe in and we have to repossess, reacquire that word and give it its good and positive meaning. So, come back. So, if we are not part of the solution, we are part of the problem. If we are not advocating peace, we are part of the problem. And this is why I encourage you to continue what you are doing. The fact that you are here uh, tonight uh, tells me that you are people who care about peace in Palestine, right? Thank you. Okay, uh, this may be familiar uh, with many of you. You can see this is Jerusalem, and you can see the Dome of the Rock in the middle, and you can see the Al-Aqsa Mosque, it's closer to us. The Dome, uh, yeah, Al-Aqsa Mosque. You know, uh, mm -hmm. yes, the whole thing, yes, the whole compound is Al-Aqsa Mosque. Well, this is, uh, a, by the way, this PowerPoint uh, is for you, all right? This means if you put your name on a piece of paper, we can send it to you and you can use it because this, our purpose is for you to be the peacemaker and use these pictures, these PowerPoints to promote peace and justice um, in your community, all right? So at, at the end, yeah, all of these slides 
can be yours. Uh, but th this is an area that is contested because uh, Jews believe at one time they used to have a temple there. Christians believe at one time Jesus went into that temple. And of course, Muslims believe that this is uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque where uh, Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salam, he went from Mecca, the Surat al-Isra, and he came into the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So it's holy for the three religions. Maybe I should mention something here that is not well known in the West. Uh, the Zionist movement really is not a religious movement. It's a secular movement. And those who started the Zionist movement and started the State of Israel, and many in government, don't want trouble in Al-Aqsa Mosque. In fact, in 1967, when Israel captured Al-Aqsa Mosque, they were very worried that this could create a problem with the Muslim world. So they had the chief rabbi give a fatwa saying that even though the temple used to be here, the temple is so holy that the center of the temple, the Holy of Holies, only one person could enter it, the chief priest, once a year after he goes through a lot of rituals. And when he would enter, he would have bells around him and he would be tied with a rope so that if God thought that he was sinful, he could die. And they would use the rope to pull him out. So after, after 2,000 years ago, when the temple was destroyed, uh, Jews stopped believing that the temple is very important. And so when they captured Jerusalem in 1967, they had a fatwa that says, since we don't know exactly where the temple was, and we don't know exactly where the Holy of Holies is, it is forbidden for any Jewish person to enter the whole compound because he may by chance step on the Holy of Holies. In fact, today, if you go to Jerusalem, you will see signs at all the entrances saying it's forbidden for any Jew to enter it. The only people who thought otherwise were a very small, tiny, radical, right-wing minority who wanted to create a new temple. And they have some support among Christian Zionists in this country who give them a lot of money to build a new temple. And the Israeli government doesn't want that because they know that that is a big problem. Uh, there were actually two attempts where they tried to destroy Al-Aqsa, uh, the Dome of the Rock. Uh, one with 200 kilograms of TNT that were found uh, on the rooftop of a yeshiva, a religious school about 200 uh, meters from the place. Another time when there was an Air Force pilot who was very religious, who was planning to bomb it, and had a couple of trial runs to test how it is. Fortunately, they caught him both times. There's a section in the Shin Bet that tries to keep track of these people because they know how dangerous it is. The problem is that over the last few years, these right-wing people, who used to be a very small fringe minority, are becoming more and more powerful, and they are now part of the Israeli government. In fact, even Trump's plan hints that maybe we have to make arrangements for everybody to pray in the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. So it, it is really very scary, very frightening, not just for Muslims, but also for ordinary Israelis. What could happen if these right-wing people get a hold of the government and influence it in, in, in this direction? Well, this is a replica of um, 
the temple as some of the Jewish people envision the, how the temple used to be. And something like this they want to rebuild in place of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Here is uh, one of the Israeli uh, ministers, and he is, you know, agreeing that, uh, that uh, the Jews should have a third temple in place of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. So Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the Palestinian president, also is very upset about this. PA chairman accuses Israel of trying to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, by allowing Jews to pray on the Temple Mount. Uh, Jewish MKs, MKs means members of Knesset, uh, call for building of a third Jewish temple in Jerusalem. That's a quotation from Haaretz, uh, one of the Israeli uh, newspapers. And one third of Israeli Jews want the temple uh, rebuilt in Jerusalem. Uh, among religious Jews questions, 43% support reconstruction of the Jewish shrine. However, the poll also reveals that more than 31% among Israel's secular Jews also support such an initiative. So you can see it's a real danger and it's growing. That danger is growing. So you wonder why Palestinians are upset? You wonder why you see young Palestinians throwing stones or burning tires? Because when they hear all of these stories about the temple, many of them get really upset. So the consequences is unrest in the Middle East, future wars and bloody conflicts, end of the church, I'm talking to Christians here, end of the church in the Holy Land, because many, many Christians, as a result of the turmoil, they leave the country and failure of future peace initiatives. So as long as they don't give justice to Muslims and to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, there will never be a genuine peace in the Holy Land. So I promise you 10 ways for you to promote peace in Israel and Palestine or Palestine-Israel. And here's the first one. Are you ready? You can count. Uh, on your 10 fingers. Number one, all right? Draw on your spiritual resources, whether you are Muslim, Christian, or Jew. We all have religious traditions that will promote peace. In uh, the Bible, you know, uh, when I talk to Christians, I quote these verses. Uh, it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. Also, if you look on the side there, it says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The idea here is that all of us, in our religious traditions, we have uh, verses, we have passages, whether it is the Holy Quran or the Bible or the Torah that promote peace. And we need to try to dig for these verses and use them to bring about peace. This is important because there is an alternative uh, narrative that says it's just power, it's just weapons, it's just violence. There are people on both sides who think that the other side only understands the language of violence. So you violence and you counter violence and you, sh you shoot and they shoot back and, and they, they drop a bomb and you try and place a bomb and if you can't place it, you send a suicide person to kill and if he doesn't, he uses a, gun, a knife. Or this mentality that violence is our only weapon, that the battle is a battle of violence, really has harmed us. Most of the activities of the Palestinians have been non-violent. We do strikes. We do hunger strikes. We do demonstrations. We go to the United Nations. We try to appeal to the conscience of the world. So we try to find different ways. We boycott. We call for divestment. We call for sanctions, BDS. All of these are non-violent methods. 
people think if I stop shooting, nothing happens. If I don't kill, then they don't listen. I have to make them suffer in order for them to feel with me. We don't realize that when you make them suffer, they can make you suffer 100 times as much. So the question is not violence. We have to think of new ways to, in fact, work for justice, but not always using the gun. There are other methods. Number two, commit to justice and peace for both Israelis and Palestinians. When we are talking peace, we are not saying we want only peace for one side. We are talking we want peace for everybody. Every Muslim, every Jew, every Christian, every person, even all the Arabs in the neighborhood and neighboring countries. So, uh, when you are speaking to Americans and they talk to you about peace, always emphasize that when you are talking about peace, you are talking about peace for everyone, not only for one party. Yeah, this is hard for us because we're used to think in binary terms. It's us versus them. There's the occupier, the occupied. There's the oppressor and there's the victim. And, and this kind of mentality doesn't help anybody. It certainly doesn't help us. We must always think in terms that apply to both sides. And we have to also teach ourselves to think in both terms, to think how can we find ways to move together uh, towards justice. Okay, uh, point number three, <coughs> educate yourself. If you want to be a peacemaker, a peace activist, you need to know what is happening. So this is a very important. And here are some of the things. Um, yeah, examine the claims. Israelis have claims, Palestinians have claims. We need to examine the claims. Beware of false assumptions. There are many, many false assumptions. I'll give you a few examples. Look at the maps. Study UN resolutions. Follow what is happening on the ground. Get your news from reliable sources. I give you an example, Haaretz is a, 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 an Israeli newspaper, but very progressive and gives the Palestinian point of view. Al Monitor, Jewish Voice for Peace. It's a group, uh, are you familiar with this? Yeah. Jewish Voice for, yeah. Um, and your denominational newsletter. In your case, I would say most of, uh, you here uh, most likely are Muslims. I would say uh, go for uh, websites, Islamic websites that comes from the United States. There are wonderful Islamic websites. One of them comes from Chicago. So try to find out what's happening by these uh, websites. I said look at the maps. The maps can tell a story and if you take these maps to your uh, friend, your American friends, just show them the progression of the maps. This is uh, Palestine before, uh, during the, even before the British mandate, or this is what we call the Zionist ambition. The Zionists drew the, this map and they gave it to the British people and they said to the British government, this is what we want. All of Palestine, plus part of Transjordan. This is Palestine during the British mandate from about 1918 uh, to about 1948. So the land was called what? Palestine. Palestine. And the people who lived there were called? Palestinians. Yes, whether they were Muslims, Christians, or Jews, all of them were called Palestinians. Okay, the map on the left is the 1947 UN partition of Palestine. The United Nations decided the areas in the red should be a Palestinian state, the area in the yellow a Jewish state. The white zone that includes Jerusalem would be international zone under the United Nations. Of course, uh, Palestinians did not accept this. They rejected the UN partition of 1947, why? 
<laughs> because they were the majority of the people. Uh, and also because they owned over 80% or over 85% of the land. So it was very, very difficult for the Palestinians to let these new Jewish immigrants coming from Europe to take uh, their country. But this is what the United Nations did. However, after that, a war happened. Why did the war happen? And this is for important for us to, to know today. The war did not happen because Palestinians rejected this map. The war happened because as soon as Israel made this map, I mean the United Nations made this map, Israelis started pushing Palestinians from the yellow zone. About 300,000 Palestinians became refugees. Then the Arab countries started wanting to fight Israel after already 300,000 Palestinians became refugees from the yellow zone. By the way, this is part of the false narrative that you hear in the United States all the time. That the Arabs not only rejected it, they attacked Israel and Israel was forced to defend itself. The truth is, yes, there was fighting by both sides, but it was the Jews who attacked. None of the Arab armies entered any of the area that was supposed to be for the Jewish state. They could barely hang on to some, not all, of the area that was Arab. They did attack here in Jerusalem, and they took East Jerusalem, not from the Jewish side, but from East Jerusalem, it became East Jerusalem. Yeah, so uh, in 1948, at the end of the war, that became, the, the one to the right became the, the map, Israel took not only what the United Nations gave it, but also the areas in the solid red. What was left for the Palestinians, the shaded areas, which are the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, took over the West Bank, and Egypt took over the Gaza Strip. Nothing was left for Palestinians to create a state. All of these dots are Palestinian towns and villages that were either destroyed or depopulated by the Israelis in 1948. And most of these villages were totally destroyed or demolished. The people, uh, you know, they locked their doors, the doors of their houses. They took the key and ran away as refugees. The Israelis made a decision. No refugee was allowed to come back. Anyone who tried to come back was shot and killed at the border. And so the bulk of the refugees stayed in refugee camps, uh, many until today. This is an important point because many of the Israeli uh, apologists or supporters say they left on their own. We didn't push them out. Uh, some, some did leave on their own because they were afraid. Some left at gunpoint because they were literally deported. But either way, all of them were kept out, were not allowed back in. Even though every year from 1948 to 67, the UN passed a resolution, usually sponsored by the US, by the way, calling for the refugees to return. And the Israelis would never allow the right of return for the refugees. This became the map in 1949, where you see Jordan now took over the West Bank and Egypt took over the uh, Gaza Strip. 1967, another round of war. Israel took the West Bank from Jordan, the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, and the Golan Heights up on top. Looks like a pair it took it from Syria. Big problem became bigger, and the number of refugees almost doubled. This is the West Bank, and this is where the, the heart of the problem as far as us Palestinians are concerned. Because since 1967, Israelis have been coming to the West Bank and building Jewish settlements in the West Bank. These Jewish settlements in the West Bank have become the biggest obstacle to peace in the Middle East. Why is that? Because Jewish settlers in the West Bank, they want to live in the West Bank but they want to be citizens of the state of Israel. They want to pay taxes 
to the state of Israel. They want to fight in the army of the state of Israel, and they are totally against the possibility of having a Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And that's why Palestinians are not so happy, other than the fact that these settlements are taking their land, demolishing their homes, and terrifying their children day in and day out. This is very important because between 1967 and, and today, most people who are interested in peace and justice talk about a two-state solution. They talk about making the West Bank and Gaza a Palestinian state in return for giving up our claims to what was the state of Israel in 1967. Uh, most churches, most people in the United States, until the present government, all the governments of the United States, as well as the rest of the world, believed in some form of two-state solution. All the time, more and more settlements were being built and expanded. They set up a system of roads that connects them to each other and to Israel. They set up a totally apartheid system in the occupied territories to the point where the two-state solution was no longer possible. It's very important to explain to Americans, anybody who cares about peace and justice, who still talk about a two-state solution, that that solution was destroyed not because the Palestinians or the Arabs did not accept it. In fact, all the Arab countries and all the Islamic countries totally accepted it under the Saudi plan, a total two-state solution. It was the Israelis and particularly the settlers who have undermined it. What's happened now with Trump is almost a clear declaration that there will never be a real state. There will be something, we'll call it a state, but there will never be a two-state solution, which is why I said it is time now to rethink the whole problem. So this is the Oslo uh, map uh, from 1993. Uh, after Rabin, Yasser Arafat, and Clinton shook hands. And this is the first stage of Oslo. Uh, the, the small circle is the Jericho area, uh, yeah, and the larger circle is the Gaza Strip. That was supposed to be the start of what would be given to the Palestinians. The idea was within five years, the Palestinians will have their independent state. They but we know expand this area. Area A will expand to cover almost all the West Bank during the five year interim period. This is the Oslo Agreement I mentioned to you where I was involved in the negotiations. The idea was we were working towards a full state in the West Bank and Gaza. These are the roads that were supposed to connect them under that agreement four roads, at least one of them will be open all year round except for one day. This is the second Oslo agreement. And you can see here that uh, more areas were given to the Palestinians. However, they were all surrounded by uh, bypass roads, Israeli bypass roads, by settlements. And when Palestinians saw this, it gave them a really a nightmare. They called it the Swiss cheese uh, agreement. And this led to the second uprising uh, or intifada. And it was a very, very uh, violent intifada on both sides. Uh, this is the wall that the Israelis have built. Notice uh, the wall is in blue. The wall is in blue. So. Most of the wall, over 90% of the wall, is built within the Palestinian territories and not on the border between Israel and Palestine. So if your American friends say, what's wrong with the wall? It's built for security reasons. It's built to keep the terrorists away. Tell them it's okay security. It's okay to fight violence. 
but why do you have to come inside my home to build a wall between my kitchen and my bathroom? So this is the, the problem why Palestinians are rejecting the, the wall. So you can see the decline from 1940, I mean 1920s, the British mandate until what's happening today. Okay, um, a lot of um, US citizens and apologists for the state of Israel will say the Arabs never had a peace initiative. They always reject whatever is given to them, but they never have any creative ideas of making a peace. Well, that is wrong because the Arabs have what we call the Saudi Peace Initiative of 2002. Jonathan, would you read it, please? The initiative calls for normalization of relations between the Arab region, actually, and also the Muslim countries, all of them, and Israel in exchange for full withdrawal by Israel from the occupied territories, including East Jerusalem, and a just settlement of the Palestinian refugee problem based on UN Resolution 194. This is basically the Arab acceptance of the two-state solution. Uh, the Israelis didn't even bother responding to this peace initiative. So anytime uh, you know, someone tells you that the Palestinians are not trying to make peace, or the Arabs are not interested in peace, you can show them this. Okay, I call this the Israeli dilemma. What is the dilemma? Many Israelis are against the one-state solution most Israeli leaders are against a two-state solution. This is an Israeli dilemma, a Palestinian nightmare, and a challenge to peacemakers everywhere. Now, if you think the situation in the West Bank is bad, the situation in the Gaza Strip is 10 times worse. The Gaza Strip is surrounded by walls, uh, from every side, even the Egyptian side, there is a little opening at the Rafah uh, crossing. But otherwise, the Gaza, the people, two million people in Gaza are trapped in there. The United Nations say these people um, are threatened. Uh, the whole Gaza population is really threatened with extinction. So the, the Gaza situation is, is really terrible. And so, uh, what we need to say to our American friends, to our congressmen and women, to our representatives, that we, don't, we can't wait for a peace agreement to relieve the people of the Gaza. The people of Gaza need peace today. The people in Gaza need to live today. And, and so I urge you to be an activist. Go to your congressman, congresswoman. And, and urge them to work for peace and justice for the sake of the people of Gaza. This is important because many people will tell you what is the solution. And then they'll spend all their time arguing. Should it be two states? Should it be one state? What's wrong with this solution? How can we be sure about that solution? And they waste a lot of time and energy while people <coughs> suffer. There are certain things that can be done now. <coughs> Peace may become in the future, but in the meantime, we should lift the siege of Gaza. You have two million people living under constant siege. They have only four hours of electricity every day. They don't have drinkable water. They don't have the ability to live normal life. So let's leave the solution till later. Meanwhile, let's open up Gaza. Let's end the siege. If you want to check for weapons, you can check for weapons, but anything else can should go in and out. Actually, weapons go in anyway. But if you really want people to live, you have two million people. They are human beings. They, they, they need to lift the siege. So there are certain things that can be done immediately instead of just waiting for peace to come. All right. What is this number for, get to the bottom line? A peace activist, uh, or if you have a peace group here, uh, summarize what you believe in just one sentence. And that's what I call it the bottom line. 
for example, here is one sentence I created for myself. But you may agree with me, and you may not, but you can make your own sentence. Would you read it, Jonathan? Palestinians want to end the conflict because they have the most to gain from signing a peace agreement with Israel. The Israeli government is trapped in the grip of fanatic Israeli ideologues who prefer the acquisition of land in the West Bank to making peace with the Palestinians. So, when people ask me, what's the Arab-Israeli conflict all about? I summarize it with this sentence. You can do that. And if you don't like it, you can have your own sentence. But it will summarize the, the problem in a nutshell. But here is another bottom line that may be interesting also. Go ahead. The U.S. is unable to broker peace between Israelis and Palestinians because U.S. lawmakers abide by the dictates of APAC, the American-Israeli Political Action Committee, which supports the radical policies of the Israeli right wing. You want to make a little comment on that? Well, right now, uh, the most radical, the most right wing elements have sort of captured U.S. policy, even more than the Israeli government. Uh, and they were the ones behind the, the Trump peace plan. A lot of good people in Israel, including Zionists, including even moderate Israelis, are saying this is not a peace plan. This is not something anybody can accept. But, but because of people like Pompeo, Pence, the Friedman, their uh, ambassador, Jared Kushner, uh, Greenblatt, all of them. It's almost the most right-wing people are now controlling U.S. Uh, policy. Uh, and, and decent people, reasonable people, moderate people, even in the Israeli and the Zionist camp, are, are, have no, nothing to say. And they need help. They need help. All right, uh, number five, confront injustice. And how are Palestinians confronting injustice? In many ways, but I'll give you one way. Palestinian Christians have a document called the Kairos Palestine document. Now, when I'm in churches, I'm talking in churches, I emphasize this. But um, uh, if you are curious, go to the website www.kairospalestine and you can read the document and the churches in the Holy Land have all come together trying to defend the Palestinian cause through nonviolent means and that's what the document is all about. Now, is it possible to have peace in the Middle East? And Jonathan, please read. Yeah. Uh, Nonviolence can be a very active tool to achieve justice. It, it ended the British colonial rule in India. It terminated the apartheid regime in South Africa. It created, it helped lead to the collapse of the former Soviet Union. It was instrumental in the success of the civil rights movement in the United States. Sometimes we forget that, that history is moving forward and people and people power can be very effective, much more so than weapons and uh, violence. People forget that a, a hundred years ago, women didn't even have the vote in the United States. 150 years ago, African Americans were bought and sold as property. And now they have become they even have the U.S. president. There's still some problems, but in terms of equality before the law, they've made great progress, not through violence, not through defeating and killing and, and, and conquering the, 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 the whites in this country, but through a nonviolent struggle for human rights. So don't, don't, uh, don't think that nonviolence is not powerful and effective. It can be a very effective weapon. Uh, one form of nonviolence is the BDS movement. B stands for boycott, D for divestment, and S for sanctions. This is a, a movement 
that is gaining momentum all over the world. Many, many countries in the world now are boycotting products that are produced in Israeli uh, settlements uh, in the West Bank uh, and so on. So uh, consider uh, privately yourself. You can, you can even join the BDS movement without raising a flag by deciding what to buy and what not to buy. Educate grassroots America. What we believe is that we need to work on two streams at the same time. The American people, they need to be educated about what's happening in Palestine. This is why Jonathan and I are going all over the United States and trying to have seminars in colleges, in schools, in universities, in churches, in mosques, anywhere people invite us, we go and try to educate Americans about what is happening in Palestine. So we, we want to teach the grassroots, but at the same time, we want to reach members of Congress, lawmakers, and we need to do it both at the same time. Americans have the right to know. Challenge Christian Zionism. Any of you know what Christian Zionism is? Put your hand up. Okay, some of you know. Well, okay, uh, Christian Zionism are Christians who believe in the right of Israel and Israel alone to have the Holy Land. No other people, just Israel. And we are also trying to help American Christians and churches to snap out of Christian Zionism. Here is a definition of Christian Zionism. Would you read it, please? It's the wedding of theology and politics. It's been invoked for over 100 years. It believes that the modern secular state of Israel is a continuation of the Israel in the Bible, and that today's Israel enjoys political and spiritual privileges that are not shared by any other nation in the world. Uh, now, we, when we talk about Christian Zionism, we try to show not only that it's wrong, not only that it doesn't help peace, but that it doesn't fit with Jesus' teaching in the Bible. Because if you go to people and tell them Christian Zionism is wrong, say, no, God said it, it's in the Bible. So don't talk to me about international law or human rights. You have to talk to people from the Bible. You yeah, know, many people, especially evangelicals, uh, we call them in Arabic, usuliyin. They go back to the text. So if you don't know the Bible, and if you don't go back to the text to show them that Christian Zionism is wrong, then, then you cannot convince them. Because if God said something, who are you to tell them otherwise? So you have to show them that this is not what God teaches in the Bible. One of the leaders of Christian Zionism is called John Hagee. And this is a quotation from John Hagee. He says, America should not pressure Israel to give up land. And America must never pressure Israel to divide the city. Notice how he is using a, a religious argument to achieve a political objective. So that Israel can keep all of Jerusalem, he says, we as Christians, he says, as Christian Zionists, we support Israel's political objective. Of course, there's nothing in the Bible that supports that, but that's how we go. Uh, in order to respond to Christian Zionism, I came up with this chart. If you are interested in it after the meeting, I'd be glad to share more about it. But uh, this is a way I and uh, Jonathan Kutab refute Christian Zionism, and we call it a biblical alternative to Christian Zionism. How to interact with Christian Zionists? Would you read this? Yes. What, what we do is we, we, we talk to them directly. We meet with them. You react to them with love and humility. We explain to them that according to the Bible, there is a different way of reading it. We help them to focus on Jesus and his teaching rather than on the end time prophecy and the Akhir's demand, this will happen in Armageddon, all these things. We have a conference that we were holding in Bethlehem once every two years. It will be held this June. 
where we actually bring in many Christians, including Christian Zionists, and we talk to them about the Bible and what does it really teach in light of the current realities. Number eight, engage members of Congress. You see, this is my drawing. I'm a great artist. <laughs> OK. Um, the, the big bus is the grassroots, the people, the American people. The small car is members of Congress. The idea is, in order to achieve peace, you need to work on both at the same time. Uh, try to educate Americans, and at the same time, try to have a message to members of Congress. Number nine, respond immediately. If you hear some terrible news, don't wait two or three months. The sooner you respond to the news, the more effective you are as an individual or if you have a task force of peace and justice. Like when we found out that these people, Trump decided to have these people to make peace, and we know all of them are Zionists, all of them are friends of Netanyahu. All of them believe in the Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Immediately, all of us should have said to the president, Foul, there is something wrong. You chose the wrong people to make peace. Now we are seeing that by choosing these people, the peace process that, or the deal of the century will not succeed. It's a one-sided uh, peace process. All right, uh, before we open it up for questions and answers, I, I want to add something because I see a lot of people here are from the Arab uh, community. Uh, I, I have a word for our people. We need to also be ourselves. Uh, Trump's plan.